Hello my wonderful viewers. As you know, I usually talk in my videos, however, this time I'm going to do something different. Savannah knows more about medical practices than I do, so I'm going to toss it over to her. Take it away. As long as there have been sicknesses, people have used all sorts of remedies to alleviate their symptoms and cure their illnesses. However, the large majority of practices people have used over the years don't work. So we're going to look at a few crank medical practices people still perform, including faith in crystal healing and homeopathy. And then we're going to look at the modern movement that conflicts with life-saving medicines, the anti-vaxxers. But before we do that, we're going to look at the placebo effect, demand characteristics, and how medicines are tested. So let's jump right in. Placebos are treatments that have no active ingredients. In other words, they don't actually treat anything. They can be in the form of a sugar pill or a saline injection, and they can have either positive or negative effects. For example, placebos have positively affected depression, general pain, sleep disorders, irritable bowel syndrome, and menopause. This works because the patient's brain believes that the placebo pill or solution will relieve the symptoms or even cure the disease, so the patient's body might be stimulated to cure the disease. Thus, researchers must take this phenomenon into account when testing new medicines. Similarly, demand characteristics must be taken into account for testings. Demand characteristics are psychological or physiological effects that patients expect they should have following a treatment. For instance, if a doctor tells you you're going to receive a medicine that's supposed to have a beneficial impact on your health, then you might feel better in the short term. However, your ailment might not really be gone. With both of these understood, we can look at double-blind experiments. A double-blind experiment is a type of medicine testing where neither the experimenter nor the participant knows what treatment is given. A third party randomly assigns the treatments and placebos. The control group, that is, the group that doesn't receive the treatment, receives placebos, while the experimental group receives the treatment. Then, the experimenters can evaluate the effects of the treatment versus that of the placebo to determine if it had any statistically significant effects. This is an incredibly useful method for testing treatments, as it greatly minimizes bias in both experimenters and participants. So with all of this in mind, let's turn to crank medical practices. First, faith healing. This is the practice whereby a person prays to a deity or deities over another person in the hopes of curing some disease. This is also probably the oldest form of, air quotes, healing, as religiosity has long been part of human cultures. Now, we've no reason to believe that praying to any deity confers any demonstrable health benefits, not even a consistent placebo effect. The 2006 paper, Study of the Therapeutic Effects of Intercessory Prayer in Cardiac Bypass Patients, a multi-center randomized trial of uncertainty and certainty of receiving intercessory prayer, concludes, quote, Intercessory prayer itself has no effect on complication-free recovery from coronary artery bypass graft surgery, but certainty of receiving intercessory prayer was associated with a higher incidence of complications, close quote. In other words, if people didn't know they were being prayed for, then they fared normally on average. However, if they did know, they did worse on average. So that's the best prayer healing does. Average. But what's the worst it does? Since no studies have consistently shown that prayer healing works, and certainly no studies have shown that the deity being prayed to exists, it is not a valid medical practice. That said, people still defend it. See Jackson's video, Talking with Diplomat 655, link in the description below. And worse, practice it, causing disastrous results. For instance, numerous deaths have resulted from attempted faith healings, and in some particularly terrifying cases, the two Pennsylvania churches, Faith Tabernacle Congregation in North Philadelphia and First Century Gospel Church in Juniata Park have been linked to around two dozen children's deaths. Rita Swan, president and founder of the organization Children's Health is a Legal Duty, or CHILD, collected records over the years of children who died at the hands of religious institutions and reached frightening conclusions. 
In the 1998 paper, Child Fatalities from Religion-Motivated Medical Neglect, she wrote that between the years 1975 and 1995, 172 children died due to religious institutions in America. However, 140, or 81%, had at least a 90% chance of surviving with medical treatment for their ailments. And since 1976, 82 faith healing child deaths have been linked to the fundamentalist Mormon Church of the Firstborn. Should the parents responsible be prosecuted for their negligence? So what about crystal healing? This is an alternative medical practice where crystals and stones are used to cure diseases or relieve symptoms by allowing positive energy to flow into the body while negative energy flows out. Tell me, what do we call alternative medicine that works? Anyway, there is unsurprisingly no evidence that crystal healing works, which is why no doctors prescribe it to you. The reason for this is that there's no demonstrable positive or negative energy in the body, and there's no evidence that crystals can channel energy. Oh well, at least they've been shown to act as placebos, which is substantially better than prayer. Jacqueline Glenn takes a look at crystal healing in her video, Crystal Healing, A Cure for Cancer? And rationality rules eviscerates the pseudoscience and super deluxe crystal healing, debunked, new age thought debunked. Now for homeopathy. This is the idea that like cures like, that if you take a very tiny dosage of something dangerous, then your body will build up an immunity to that thing. For example, if you ingest a diluted sample of arsenic, then your body should build up an immunity to arsenic. The only problem is that the body doesn't work like this. It doesn't matter how much arsenic you take, your body will still be susceptible to arsenic poisoning. Despite the fact that this is well known among doctors, there are still, no joke, journals of homeopathy with important sounding articles like the defining role of structure including epitaxy and the plausibility of homeopathy. Another video by Rationality Rules addresses the ridiculousness of homeopathy. Sorry to interject, I even have a friend, who prefers to remain anonymous at this point, that dabbled in New Age healing practices. He kindly shared his thoughts on the subject with me. He said, quote, To begin with, most truly believe they are healing people. The field is not fraught with con men and thieves as one might think. They tend to encourage one another in a strange game of confirmation bias. I tell you how amazing your gifts are, and then you return the favor. The clients are in the same boat. They are scared and really want to feel like they have some active role in the healing, which of course is pushed along by the healer. On the surface, it looks like all hugs and new age loving kind of stuff, but in reality it is just like any other religious practice. There is an invasive fear-driven culture. Fear of bad energy, big pharma, the alignment of the planets, yes really, dark magic, fear of angering this deity or that. It all boils down to blame. They are sick because the government puts chemicals in our food and water, they allow someone's bad energy to weaken them, didn't pray right, or perform the right rituals. My opening line was, well, we can help you get better, but not until you can admit why you got sick in the first place. I truly believe that was true. I was just a conduit for whatever universal healing energy needed to use me to heal them. This absolves the healer of any and all culpability in the process. Close quote. Last, but certainly not least, in this video, we will address the anti-vaxxer movement. Comedian and political commentator John Oliver summed up the anti-vaxxer movement and its impacts rather well in the video Vaccines Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Regardless, we will go through some of the movement's highlights. Although anti-vaxxers have been around many years longer than the term vaccine has, some relatively recent events have amped up the anti-vaxxer movement, specifically the mistake of Andrew Wakefield. In 1998, Wakefield, a surgeon at the time, published an article in the medical journal The Lancet where he claimed that the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, or MMR vaccine, were linked to autism and bowel disease. Since it was released, numerous studies have been conducted, such as the 2002 paper, Measles, Mumps, and Rubella Vaccination and Bowel Problems or Developmental Regression in Children with Autism, Population Study, showing that there is absolutely no causal link between the MMR vaccine and autism or bowel disease. What the article did cause, however, was many parents to stop having their children receive vaccinations, which has had horrendous effects. The lack of vaccines has historically caused a rise in all sorts of preventable diseases, including measles, mumps, and rubella, as well as pertussis and polio. 
In every case here, we see that a lack of science, specifically medical education, results in either bad methodology, harmful results, or both. We use medicines because they are tested repeatedly, and the effects are known. We can demonstrably show that real, not alternative, medicine works. On that note, thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time.